Welcome to worship. I hope this time can give you strength and fuel you for your faith journey. This past June, I was blessed with the opportunity to join a group from Abiding Hope for a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. One thing that I was surprised about was how mountainous and rocky the terrain was. It's no wonder in the Bible we hear so many references to the rocky places, which represented places of protection, hiding places, as in a crevice, a cliff, or a cave. David sought refuge when running from his enemies. Elijah sought a rocky crevice to speak with God. And Moses went up to the rocky cliffs to receive the law from God. The rock is a place of refuge, protection, and strength. And it is the solid foundation on which our faith is built. God is that rock, the solid rock on which we stand. So let us join together and worship our rock and our strength. rock and strength be with you. Let us pray. Loving God, help us to remember that you are alive in us. When we serve one another, we serve you. When we seek justice for the oppressed, we are seeking justice for you. When we live into the ways of unity and peace, we are living in your ways. Renew us and make us whole when we feel downtrodden, when we are struggling, and when the challenges of the world seem unsurmountable. Remind us that you have walked this path, and you walk it with us now. In Jesus' name we pray.
The reading for today is from the Gospel of Matthew, the 16th chapter. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're in a season where we're talking about thresholds. Uh, thresholds we often think of or we picture as like a door. Um, and uh, in uh, Celtic spirituality, it's really about how things are different from we move from one space into another. Now, that can mean literally sometimes, you know, uh, maybe when you step into mom and dad's old house or into grandpa and grandma's old place, how just the feel is different from when you move from this space to this space. Uh, or it could just mean like when you walk into a, a, a one kind of environment into another kind of environment. When we were uh, spending time in Spain more than a year ago, uh, there was something holy that would happen when we when we moved from outside in a courtyard into the mesquita, the one of the world's largest mosques, or when we moved inside the the cathedral in Sevilla. There's something different that happens when you move from this space to that space. You kind of go from the lights and the sun and the birds into quiet and reverence. There's this idea of moving from here, from this threshold into that threshold. We can look at the same thing when we think about our own lives, where there's that moment, that, that instant, where everything changes from where we are in this space to suddenly moving into. Now, I can mean this physically, but I, it, it's meant to be taken much more spiritually, that if this idea, if this concept is through, if, if we really are, uh, if, if this thing is really true, or if this reality is, is made full, then I have to be different moving forward. So there's lots of ways to think of threshold. And I really want to think about that second threshold, that second idea. In our gospel text, it's really a combination of both of these ideas of the threshold. Jesus is walking with the disciples and they're, they're traveling and they're heading to a place called Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi was a, a resort town. It was a place that people would go and relax and there's baths and, and uh, you will see some of the imagery in our worship today of what that space looked like. But as they're walking along the road, heading into Caesarea Philippi, as they're coming across that long threshold, there would have been all of these statues on either side of the road. And they had statues to all the different gods as they were walking down the road, all of the different Roman gods as they were walking into Caesarea Philippi. And so you can imagine that Jesus with the disciples walking towards this resort town with all of these statues and seeing their name and understanding and knowing what their visage is and knowing what all of these statues are about and seeing them all, turns and asks a question of the disciples. It's not out of the blue. It's not sort of like a, a pop quiz, kids, who do you say that I am? But really more of a, a response to the environment, that they're on a threshold, that they're moving into a new space, and they're seeing all of these pictures, images, statues. And Jesus stirs something up in here and says, I see all of these gods. And turns to the disciples and says, who do you say that I am? Or what is the world? Well, no, he starts by saying, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? And the disciples answer in a very sort of noncommittal way at the start. Some say 
prophet, some say John the Baptist. So they, they're sort of grasping at what, what Jesus is. And then finally, Jesus turns this corner where it's no longer, well, who do people, where they can answer sort of anonymously, turns to them and say, well, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And it's only Peter that responds here. Would have loved to have seen what that environment would have looked like. Were the other, were the other disciples sort of sheepish? Did they not have something to say? Was there a pause? Was there, uh, an, it, there were there suddenly they were in a space where they're saying, "Well, who do we say that you are, and, and who are you?" And I'm wondering what happened in that moment. But we what we do know is that Peter speaks up. And Peter says, "You are the anointed one." The Hebrew word is Messiah. The the one who is to be king, the son of the living God, God's own offspring, God's own child. And something happens in this space. It's like something clicks. Up to this time in Matthew, there's questions and there's curiosity about who Jesus is and there's, there's wonderings and there's ponderings. And, and finally, finally in this moment, we get an answer. And, and it's Peter, of all the disciples, it's Peter that answers the question. Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For the world has not revealed this to you, but God has revealed this to you. And you from now on are going to be called Peter the Rock. And he, in a, the Aramaic Cephas, that's why you might see that in some places. But I'm going to call you the Rock. And upon you upon this rock, upon your proclamation that Jesus is the Messiah, I will build the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This whole notion suddenly shifts the whole narrative of the gospel. Up to now, is, is Jesus simply uh, a, a, a prophet? Is it somebody just come to speak a word? Is it somebody who's just come to do good things? But Jesus is actually named and claimed that there, that Jesus' identity is revealed, that it, it becomes sure that we know who Jesus is. And on this proclamation, on this idea, on this understanding that, that Jesus is the anointed one, the son of the living God, we build the whole of the church, all of the church. I wonder what Again, those disciples would have thought and felt. I wonder if they all claimed it, if they all said, yes, absolutely, or if some wondered and questioned. I, I, wonder, I wonder how that moment felt. I can say that that moment for me came when I was halfway through college. Like a lot of people, I, we had our questions. I had my curiosities. I was wondering, is God a God? Is it is this kind of this presence? And, and I had this picture of God as sort of an old man in the sky that I've talked about before. And so, it, but that didn't seem right or real. And, and was, was there a God or was it just kind of groupthink or was it like a way to address onto a God our poor behavior and decisions or, or to say, I'm just doing it because God told me? I, I was really wrapped up in all of these questions. And I had a moment. I had a moment. For me, it, came with being angry and yelling and being frustrated and, and sad and feeling abandoned and feeling like that God was not there, that suddenly what was invisible became visible to me. And in my own crying out for God and crying out for an understanding of who God is and my identity and life and all of the things, God became very visible to me. And it changed the way that I lived. God didn't become visible to me, visible to me in some sort of spiritual way. I didn't have um, a, a, a spiritual moment. It actually became visible to me through people. It was, it was seeing this in then friend, soon after girlfriend, soon after wife. That in that mystery, in that loss of self and identity. I had this person come and remind me who I am, that I saw God in her. I saw God in this church that I was attending and the students that I was working with. 
the conversations that we were having, me as this 20-year-old kid and trying to work myself out and seeing myself in these students and being asked to lead in that space, I saw things changing inside me. I saw it through the community that had gathered at a camp that helped inform me who I was. When, when I thought I was something else, they remind me that there was some, something greater in me, that God was doing something in me, that, that in all of these spaces, it came together in such a way that I realized everything had to be different. It was a threshold I was crossing. Threshold that said, if, if Jesus truly is pointing us to, to, toward the way to truly live, toward, toward our identity and who we are, toward what we are about, and, and if I were to proclaim that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the one who's come to bring us life and life abundant, and everything had to change. I, I had to do everything different. And I had to build my life on that proclamation and not on all the things I had thought I was building. I've recently been talking with friends of mine about Jesus and God and life and church and even asked a question on Facebook about why people have left God or faith or the church. And here's an interesting thing that I, I, I read through all of their responses. Almost all of them still cling to a life of faith in Jesus. Almost all of them still hold on to that proclamation that Jesus is Lord. Almost all of them say that they're still deeply spiritual, but their, their wounds and their woundedness comes from the church, comes from people, comes from mistakes made by leadership, some through outright abuse, others through exhaustion, others through simply saying it, they just seemed to be more concerned about the color of the tile than they were about actually building their life on the proclamation of Jesus. So a lot of my friends who have left, it's, it's interesting that in this text we have this proclamation of Jesus and then this idea of building the church in that same space. We'll see next week that Jesus immediately turns this story around and calls Peter the stumbling block. And I think there's some ways in which I've seen that, and more of that will come next week. But I've known that sometimes walking into the threshold of a space like this, one can feel disappointed, a little lost, a little, a little wounded, for lack of a better word, that coming in here may not feel safe for them. I think it's because so much of our church and our life and our culture, it's lost a little bit of its understanding of, of building on that proclamation. So maybe that's something that we can work together on church. Maybe that's something that we can move our way toward, to put ourselves in that space with the rest of the disciples who, when Peter makes that proclamation that, that Jesus is the Messiah, we're called to come and love and worship, and also follow in his way and build our life in the way of Jesus. But this has to change the way that we think, act, and work. We have to create safe places for people to come in here and be like those disciples who maybe had questions or were wondering or weren't exactly sure. We have to be a threshold for people who need to come and find healing and life and goodness and wholeness again. We need to be a place that builds itself, not on, not on the powers of the world, but on, on what happens when our minds are changed, when, when everything we think about is different. The Romans text this week talks about how do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The patterns of this world are about success and build and structure and exhaustion and and pain and politic and worrying about the color of the tile. Those are the patterns of the world. Just as I've changed my mind in that space, we're called to change the way we think, to turn our heads and to put our minds back into the place that says, if our proclamation is true, the way I think has to change. The way I act, live, behave has to change. It becomes a threshold 
from moving away from being conformed to the systems and powers that differentiate and push away, instead transformed in a place of liberty, grace, love, joy, forgiveness, hope, freedom, become a safe place, a true sanctuary for people who need to hear that Jesus is Lord. All of us are in thresholds all the time, and I'm guessing you are too. And as Pastor Julie said last week, I, I invite you to think of it this week. As you are getting into the car, and you're taking a deep breath, as you're walking out the door or walking into the door, as you're walking into your work or off to school or wherever your space is, to take that deep breath and say, if Jesus is Lord, if Jesus is the Messiah, if Jesus is showing us the way to truly live, how do I transform my mind to that idea and change the way I live so that the work and love and life that I'm doing here are based on the patterns and life and love of Jesus that release me not to hang on to the old ways, but to move into the new ways. May every day be a threshold for you as it is for all people. May every day be a threshold where you're considering how to not be conformed, but be transformed. May Every day be a moment where we can live the grace and love of Jesus. Resting in that grace, knowing that we're going to mess up every day, knowing that we're going to get it wrong every day. But the pattern of Jesus is getting it wrong is okay. But there is grace and love that Jesus has for us. and We can live the grace and love for others as well. May, may you engage the threshold with good courage heading into thresholds and spaces which you have no idea where you're going, but that you know that you are loved, supported, and moving as God is calling you to move. Let's pray with me. Lord God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, and paths as yet untrodden through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out in good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. In the name of love, whose name is Jesus. In this time of desperation, when all we know is dark and fear, there is only
with humble hearts, we come before God to release and be released, to receive and be filled. God of grace, you bless us with the gift of life and enrich us through your presence in all things and in all times. We realize the realities of the world's division and violence come into conflict with your vision of life for all creation. And so we come before you now with tired bodies, heavy hearts, and thirsty souls. As we lift our prayers to you, fill us with your spirit and stimulate in us a greater trust that your love will break through all that is broken. You envisioned a creation where in each and every moment, all living things would simultaneously reveal and radiate your loving presence. But your vision of love continues to be challenged through actions of hate, power, and greed. We lift to you all who struggle to experience love and life due to repression brought about by injustice, war, and economic hardships. Give us courage to let go of our fears, excuses, or false identities and seek the life you call us into. Empower each of us through your Holy Spirit to use the gifts and resources we have been given, not for ourselves, but to be generous and a blessing to others. Many here and in our community are struggling. We pray for those who struggle due to pain, sickness, and loss, or despair, fear, and doubt in their lives. We ask for your presence of peace, trust, hope, and wisdom. We lift all the prayer concerns in our hearts. Receive our prayers and fill us with your creative and life-giving spirit now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We invite you now to take a moment to share that peace with those in your lives. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As God's family, we pray together. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. In this bread and wine, we are reminded that Christ dwells with us and walks with us in every part of our journey of our lives. Through every threshold, God promises to walk with us, that we're not abandoned to that work, but that we're simply given a gift, a gift of bread, a gift of wine, a gift of the presence of Jesus in these and in us to send us out into the world to live as a transformed people. So come to this meal again today. Be renewed in your mind and body and spirit. And know this, the gifts of God are free.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. We are forgiven. Singing redemption song. There's a fire that burns inside. A fire that burns inside. Nothing can stop us. With a fire that burns inside, a fire that burns inside. We are the free, the free of generation, seeking a mercy. You are the one who set us all in motion. Yours is the glory. There's a fire in our hearts and it burns for you. It's never gonna fade away. We are the free and yours. Glory. We are the risen, living alive in you, and our passion will not die. No, our passion will not die. Nothing can stop us when we're running through the night, and our passion will not die. No, our passion will not die. We are the free, the free of generation, singing of mercy. You are the one who set us all in motion. Yours is the glory. There's a fire in our hearts and it burns for you. It's never gonna fade away. You are the free, and yours is the glory. You are the one who set us all in motion.